heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Scarlett Fu in for Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Alex Barinka in for Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, quite an announcement. Elon Musk teases Ron DeSantis' campaign debut on Twitter Spaces tonight. We will discuss what it signals for the future of the platform. And sticking with social media, we'll discuss the Surgeon General's warning that it could be harming children. More on the impact that platforms like TikTok and Instagram have on society. Plus, we'll talk artificial intelligence with one AI robotic startup raising $70 million to help develop a humanoid robot. All that and a lot more coming up. But first, we've got to get you a check on the markets. Uh, clearly, the focus is on the debt ceiling and talks to resolve and perhaps suspend or perhaps raise the debt ceiling. And we know that the president and Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, are meeting at this moment after a press conference by the speaker. What you're looking at right now is a decline in equities, a risk-off scenario. The Nasdaq 100 losing nine-tenths of one percent, the second day of losses after finishing at around about a 13-month high earlier in the week. And this is a global retreat from risk. You see the stock 600 losing the most in two months, a sharp sell-off there, because on top of the possibility of a U.S. default, you also had U.K. inflation rising more than expected. In addition, there are big questions over the health of China's economy, too. You had European luxury companies like uh, Richemont as well as LVMH declining on a wave of COVID infections in China. Now, speaking of which, the CSI 300 losing 1.4 percent overnight in Asia. So much for that China reopening trade. A lot of questions now about what happens going forward for China, especially as it has signaled no stimulus on the way. Uh, we know that China's stock stock index has erased all of its gains for so far this year. And any kind of China growth concerns obviously shows up in the commodity space. And so you see copper futures in the U.S. losing almost 3 percent on the day. In the U.K., copper fell below $8,000 a ton for the first time in half a year. But clearly, the big overhang over global markets is really the lack of progress, let alone resolution, on the U.S. debt ceiling as we move closer to the day that Washington runs out of cash. This is a look at how the stalemate is disrupting the short term U.S. Treasury market. The lines at the bottom here, over here, they track the yields of bills that mature in May, which would be before Janet Yellen's X date of June 1st. The lines at the top here, you could see they're all above 6 percent at the moment. These are yields on bills that mature in early to mid-June, anywhere from June 1st to June 15th. The difference between what investors are theoret theoretically demanding to get paid to hold a bill maturing on June 1st versus, say, May 30th is more than three percentage points. Alex, that is the risk that is being priced in right now. Now, I can tell you what I'm watching over here, Scarlett, is some of the tech movers or the tech big newsy stories today. Meta mar marks the last day for them on their big rounds of layoffs. The social media giant is in what it calls its year of efficiency in 2023, and they are capping off firing about 10,000 people. My sources tell me that the email went out this morning at 5 a.m. to impact employees, but on the market front, the shares are little change. I expect this is because much of that upside that Meta seen from its cost cuts have largely been priced into the shares, uh, but the employees are certainly being impacted today. The second thing I'm looking at, Scarlett, I want to take us over to the semiconductor industry. NVIDIA is down just over 2.5%. It's been one of the hottest chip stocks this year, more than doubling in 2023 because they sell semiconductors that power AI technology. But today, it seems like investors are taking a little bit of that heat off before the company reports earnings after the close. Now, I want to keep us with chips on analog devices. This is our big mover of the day. It slid about 8%, the biggest one-day decline in over three years. This chip maker gave a disappointing forecast for the current quarter on both revenue and earnings. Now, analog devices is one of the biggest producers of semiconductors for industrial equipment, factories, and cars. And it's blaming the shaky economy and its supply chain issues for this weaker demand. Yeah. Scarlett? Clearly, uh, concerns over the economy weighing on companies across the tech industry. As we mentioned at the top of the hour, Speaker McCarthy just wrapped up his uh, 
press conference to reporters, and he he sounded some pretty familiar notes. Uh, we're still far apart on the debt talks, but we can get to yes. The two sides can get to yes. So let's bring in Bloomberg's Joe Matthew, host of Power On. Uh, for Bloomberg Radio and, of course, a co-host of Balance of Power as well. Joe, what did you hear from Speaker McCarthy that was new, that was different, that gives us some sense of momentum into today's discussions? Well, you're asking the right question here, Scarlett. There's been so much noise, so much posturing, so much bluster on, on frankly, both sides of this issue for so many days that we really have to be careful to focus on where the news is. And, and if we listen to what Speaker McCarthy just said, it's actually fairly positive. He was clearly expressing frustration about what's happening here. He thinks that the president should have sat down with him uh, many weeks before this process got started. But two things jump out to me. Number one, he said, we can make progress today. And I'll remind everybody that negotiators are back at the table in the White House office building next door to the West Wing as we speak. They just started that meeting a couple of moments ago. He also said, I'm not going to give up. We won't default. That's the important takeaway, certainly for market watchers who are trying to figure out what is going to happen here. It's unclear exactly what's going to end up in this deal. But as long as the posture remains progress, we will not default on both sides of the table here. We might be able to figure this out. The problem is the timeline, of course, as you mentioned, Janet Yellen still looking at June 1st mm -hmm. as early as June 1st as an X date. And we are running out of time quickly. If he wants lawmakers to have 72 hours to read a final bill. The question is, is this going to be a working holiday for lawmakers? And we'll probably find that out tomorrow. Now, Joe, um, there was talk of progress from McCarthy. There was also talk of not raising spending levels. So to me, that sounds like yeah. he expects something to give. Is that work requirements? Is that uh, revenue taxing? Where do you think uh, is kind of the most uh, area that we might see some folks meeting in the middle here as these negotiations go on today? These are great questions, and they're difficult to answer, and it's really only the people in the room. In fact, I'm not sure negotiators could answer that question at the moment. But yeah, in terms of spending cuts and budget caps, this is an important part of this. Speaker McCarthy wants us to go back to fiscal year 22 levels. The president does not want to do that. And I'll just remind everybody that while Social Security and Medicare are off the table, and presumably it does appear that Pentagon spending is off the table, they're going to be fighting over a much smaller piece of the budget than, uh, than was expected. So to bring us back to 22 levels would, in fact, require more severe cuts to some programs. We just don't know what they are. We're talking about top-level spending, not exactly where the money is going to go. So that's one thing. In terms of work requirements, interesting, Speaker McCarthy just said, and I hadn't heard this before, that was a Democrat idea. And we know it's something that Joe Biden is open to. The problem is the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, as many as mm -hmm. 100 lawmakers, according to some, will say no to that bill. I spoke with Jim McGovern, a Democrat from Massachusetts yesterday, who said, I'm a no vote if the president puts additional work requirements. So they're trying to figure out how to get something through the center, knowing they will likely lose members on the extremes of both parties. Bloomberg's Joe Matthew, thanks for bringing us the latest on McCarthy's words this morning. Now, let's stick with Washington. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is expected to debut his presidential campaign tonight with Elon Musk on Twitter spaces. While Musk didn't outright confirm the news, he did hint at something big. We'll be interviewing um, Ron DeSantis, and he has uh, quite an announcement to make. Um, and will be, be the first time that something like this is happening on social media and with uh, real-time questions and answers, uh, not, not scripted. Uh, so it's going to be live and let, 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 let her up. Let's see what happens. With us for more on the impact on Twitter of this special announcement is Bloomberg's Asia Counts. Asia, this is a little bit of an unprecedented moment um, for the CEO of a social media company to actually be bringing in a, a candidate from one potential party for what we think will be his presidential announcement. Tell me a little bit, what's the read through here then on how we see Elon Musk recasting Twitter in his image with moments like this? Yeah, I mean, when Elon Musk first took over Twitter, part of his reason for acquiring the company was to sort of make it this free speech platform, a platform that was nonpartisan, that was open to a range of voices. But what we've seen over the past months is something entirely different. He's amplified voices of people like DeSantis who are conservative, not just conservative, but more right wing. He's given airtime and amplification to some of these voices. And by hosting DeSantis, by having an interview with him on the platform, 
Musk. That is implicit support for him. And Musk has even been vocal about supporting Republican lawmakers in the past. And, and so it, it really does paint this image of Twitter as a very partisan place, even though Musk has said otherwise. Elon Musk is also concerned about making money for Twitter as well. What does this decision to let Ron DeSantis have this space on Twitter mean for advertisers and whether they will feel comfortable uh, continuing to advertise on Twitter? It's a great question because one of the reasons that advertisers have fled Twitter since Musk took over was around content moderation or what type of content their ads might be next to. So an advertiser doesn't want an ad to be next to misinformation or hate speech or, or, or violent speech. And so when you have DeSantis coming on who has these very polarizing views, that can create a challenge. One example is Disney. Disney is one of Twitter's largest advertisers, and they're in a very public dispute with DeSantis right now over some legislation within Florida regarding uh, being able to discuss sexual identity in schools and then also over oversight of their parks. And so you can imagine that that might bring a challenge for Twitter if Disney is already in a, a big fight with DeSantis and then Twitter is giving DeSantis this sort of platform. Absolutely. It's a story that we'll, uh, we'll continue monitoring, and I know you will. Asia Counts uh, of Bloomberg News, she covers social media for us in San Francisco. Thank you so much. Now coming up on Bloomberg Technology, humanoid robots getting closer to commercialization. We're going to discuss all of that with the CEO of AI Robotics company Figure next. From New York and San Francisco, this is Bloomberg. AI robotics startup figure just raised $70 million to help develop a humanoid robot that it believes could one day take on a range of tasks traditionally performed by people and use that robot to address labor shortages, do dangerous jobs, and help support the global supply chain. Let's bring in its founder and CEO, Brett Adcock, for more on this. Brett, when you think about where figure could really um, support the workforce, can you give us a little bit of color on which industries you think have the most potential to bring in your first iteration of the figure one robot? Yeah, well, thanks for having me on today. Um... I think from like a very long-term perspective, um, we're building humanoids to do any type of physical labor that humans do today. And our go-to-market plan is to get into revenues of the business as fast as possible. Those early applications for us uh, have been in areas such as manufacturing, retail, and warehousing. We're, we're cons in, on that end, we're spending a considerable amount, amount of time in warehouses today. Um, so we hope over the next, you know, several years, we can see early applications of our robots doing physical labor work um, in, in a warehouse, such as, you know, picking items, unloading trucks, restocking shelves, depalletizing. Uh, and ultimately, we hope that humanoids can play a very big role in helping to fill this physical labor like void that we're seeing in the economy today. And there's almost 11 million unfilled jobs in the U.S. Mm -hmm. We hope that our solution here long term can help uh, really make an impact. Brett, what you described sounds similar to how machines or robots currently sort and retrieve inventory inside Amazon's gigantic warehouses. Uh, how will you improve and refine that? Yeah, I think if you walk into like a warehouse today or even like most most like, you know, companies, everything that could be automated is mostly automated today with just, you know, great robotic solutions overall. And there's a tremendous amount of work that's being done by humans that are kind of more complicated, that need extra degrees of freedom, that need to interact with some type, some type of shelf that's hard for a robot to do, or at least a single purpose robot to do. And we we believe strongly that, you know, humans built this world around ourselves to interact with a human form. And so almost as like universal general interface is a human body. If we can build a robot that can interact with that physical world similar to humans, we can come in and do human type work day one. So that means walking into a warehouse where, you know, Amazon or a bunch of these bigger groups out there have hundreds of thousands of employees that are turning over 100% per year. They're having, uh, it's really hard work. They're walking 10 miles a day, picking 50 items an hour. And, you know, the, it can be really hot and cold conditions. And um, there's basically a giant labor shortage happening here across mm -hmm. that. And we hope that we can basically go in and start doing those applications without with basically minimal interaction or minimal changes to the environment.
Brett, when I think about uh, kind of the, the area that your fresh cash is going to fund, you've also got folks like Sanctuary AI, 1X, Tesla's Optimus, Google. A lot of names are pushing into kind of this humanoid robot space. I would figure getting into a factory or a warehouse, um, those kind of clients don't want to change over from one tech to another. I'm sure the race is on. How are you looking to beat out that kind of big, also well-funded competition? Yeah, the space is certainly getting um, like really heating up, which is, I think, really positive overall. Um, the ultimate goal for us is to do useful work. Like We need to basically walk in and see a robot doing like boring, useful things all day long. And that's like the ultimate goal that we set out to in the near term is can we design a robot and can we test it? So in our lab here, we have a full warehouse built end to end. Uh, we're starting to have a conversations with some of the bigger warehousing groups uh, worldwide. And our goal is ultimately to prove that out. So we're spending a lot of this capital uh, today on just overall robot development and manufacturing. Uh, we're building out an end to end data engine so that our robots can get into the market uh, ingest data to help train our neural nets. And then we're spending a lot of time on the commercial side. Like what are the right, you know, first applications for us? And then ultimately how do we scale the robot across many applications over time? Sure. One of the big criticisms or concerns about uh, building more robots is they will take human jobs. And I know you've addressed how we have a giant labor shortage. And so this is designed to help solve for that. But I wonder as you look at um, what the prospects for your humanoid robots are, what kind of new jobs can be created because you have these humanoid robots? What do you foresee happening down the road? I mean, you have an ability to basically scale into almost infinite amount of production. And it's going to be really incredible as we think about what this can do to GDP, what this can do to ultimately the economy when there's no like per capita constraints. Um, like ultimately humanoids should be able to do any physical thing a human can. So if we have like infinite ability to scale humanoids, like what does that really do to the economy? It's, it's quite hard to fathom. We hope that we fill this area in the labor market, which is we've seen tremendous amount of job shortages. We hope over time there's a consumer aspect of putting a humanoid in a home, helping care for the elderly. And we think there's a big market opportunity for space over time and that humanoids can help colonize planets. So we think over time there's a wide range of applications, mm -hmm. even like you know, existing ones and also new we can deploy into, um, I think to build what maybe one of the biggest businesses ever built. All right, well, I guess we'll see you on Mars then. Brent Adcock, uh, CEO of Figure, also founder of the robotics company. Thank you so much. Coming up on Bloomberg Technology, we've got more conversations from the Qatar Economic Forum, including one with Claré Group founder and CEO Marcelo Claré. This is Bloomberg. Tech entrepreneur and investor Marcelo Claré says that artificial intelligence is becoming a permanent staple for all businesses and facets of society. He spoke about AI and the climate for tech valuations with Bloomberg Technology co-host Caroline Hyde at the Qatar Economic Forum. Take a listen. AI is here to stay. I think we're going to see every single business model industry vertical disrupted through the use of AI. And this is not something that's going to happen in the far future. This is happening now. It's happening today. And all you have to do is, you know, use ChatGPT to understand the power, what is happening in content, you know, how are our elections going to be affected. There's so many fascinating things that are going to happen through the true introduction of AI into every single vertical. So we look at the next five years as the years where you should invest in AI companies. Startups, not just the, it's not all going to be dominated by the big players such as OpenAI, them teaming with Microsoft or indeed a Google Spark. I mean, those are the foundational layer that are necessary, but the beautiful thing is disruption is going to happen in the application level, meaning you have so many different startups that are going to choose a specific verticals, a specific workflows to basically disrupt what happens there. Obviously, they're all going to have to be connected to one of the big foundational layer, but this is to me the internet at an exponential phase. I mean, when have we seen any application have a million customers in five days? That had never happened before. And the more you use it, the more it becomes part of your everyday life. A lot of VCs I speak to want to talk about artificial intelligence because it's basically a silver lining amid some economic clouds right now. You, I know you can't speak much about the work at SoftBank and Vision Fund, but ultimately it was 
an area that they went bigger to startups, but we've seen valuations hit hard, unsurprisingly, by the economy we're in. Do you think we're at the end point now? Are we at the, have we now seen valuations become at the level they need to be to vindicate the growth that we're seeing in these companies? Or is that more to go? Valuations are an indication of time, and I think people are confused between innovation, disruption, technology, and valuation. If we focus on valuations, the reason why valuations were so high because there was an unlimited amount of capital that was free. So when you have so much capital, there's a problem of quantity of capital. So obviously, capital is going to be deployed at an accelerated pace, and those companies, so therefore, valuations are going to be high because it was a very competitive market. As interest rates rose, you know, to, to where the levels that were today, those companies are going to generate less cash flow in the future, and therefore, logical thing is valuations are going to be different. But that doesn't mean the world has stopped, the technology companies have stopped innovating and disrupting, so that has not stopped. And what we're going to see now is valuations, to me, are an indication of the price of money and the availability of money. And today, there's less money than there was before. Money is more expensive, and therefore, valuations are going to be lower. And as interest rates, you know, in the future will continue to drop, then you will see adjustments in valuation. I don't think we're ever going to get back to the times where money was free and there was almost an unlimited amount of money. But I think we're going to be getting to a point where, you know, public markets have repriced to 50 percent yeah. below. Private markets have started to reprice, as you see, in the next new round. And I think as long as there's innovation and disruption, there is going to be sufficient capital for those great companies. Not all companies qualify, because when you have higher cost of money, not all companies will become profitable. So therefore, it's a smaller pool of investable companies that we will have. But they're great companies in the making. Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde joins us with more. Caroline, Clary is such a known quantity in tech and in telecom in the past. What are his big bets today? Yeah, he's still an operator, right? But he is in investing. He's got a couple of billion with a family office. He's looking to expand those funds, I'm sure, and manage money for others. And thus far, well, he's made inroads already into Sheen. Many use it in the U.S., of course. It's a Chinese born, now Singapore headquartered company that is disrupting the fashion world. He's actually sort of big, taken an executive position in terms of taking on the role of Latin America, but also international growth for Sheen. He's helping build manufacturing in Brazil and Mexico for this company, and he's put money to work in that business. So he's clearly executing still, looking to be that operational expertise and a gateway to Latin America. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see yet more focus on Latin America, an area that he thinks is totally undervalued by other VCs. One thing that's also interesting is really the way in which he's starting to see sovereign wealth funds maybe get in the way of prior venture capital. People are actually raising funds directly with sovereign wealth funds. They're not putting money as LPs into the VC community. So an interesting tack that he's currently seeing. But I think it's interesting that he's at this moment of trade tension, tech yeah. tension between US and China. He's still making inroads into that particular bed of the area. I would expect so. Caroline, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde, of course, at the Cutter Economic Forum, powered by Bloomberg. Coming up, mental health and social media. What is the path ahead? This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Scarlett Fu in New York. And I'm Alex Barinka in San Francisco. We're halfway through the trading day here in New York, so let's get a check on the markets. And what you're seeing is a lot of red here on the screen. A second day of losses in U.S. stocks, but it comes as the global outlook dims overall. You've got higher than expected inflation in the U.K. You also have concerns about economic growth in China, especially with a crop of COVID cases coming up as well. So there's also selling in treasuries as, of course, the debt ceiling uh, remains a big sticking point. We know the president and speaker uh, Kevin McCarthy are meeting at the moment. Yields on the 10 you're moving up to 3.73 percent. And within the U.S. equity market, a lot of pressure on financials. There are 72 big cap financial names in the U.S. market, and 71 of them are lower at the moment. One of them is Citigroup, off by 3 percent after it abandoned plans to sell its Mexican unit after talks had dragged on for more than a year. Citi was hoping that this divestment would yield about $7 billion, but the deal faces complications from Mexico's president. 
But I want to go back to tech names, of course, because if you look at the next screen here, this is a snapshot of the Bloomberg terminal. Tech names make up the top four advancers in the S&P 500 this year. NVIDIA, Meta, AMD, and Salesforce. Now, of course, one of them, NVIDIA, will be reporting earnings after the close. It has doubled in value in 2023, going from about $150 a share, just below, to above $300 of course, over all the excitement over AI. NVIDIA chips are used in computers that power AI applications, so it's become one of the most popular ways to gain exposure to this new hot trend. Meta, of course, is the other big performer here, but Meta is still about 10% below where it was at the start of 2021. Meantime, if you go back to the start of 2021, NVIDIA is up almost 130%. Alex? So the U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy issued an advisory that social media poses a risk to children's mental health. Joining us now is Adam Kavakovich, Chamber of Commerce, Chamber of Progress founder and CEO. Adam, I want to get your take on this. Uh, this idea that social media and kids are not necessarily the best combination, particularly those under the age of 13, isn't a new one. But there were some kind of new specifics that the Surgeon General mentioned, particularly around uh, who is most impacted. It was the most vulnerable kids, the ones who are being cyberbullied, the ones who might have body issues. And he also said that two in five kids between the age of eight and 12 are on social media. I want to start on the harms first that he, he pointed out. We've talked about this a lot. At what point does the chatter around the harms, does the chatter about potential legislation actually lead to some moves from Congress here in the U.S. to do something about these concerns that Vivek Murthy is mentioning? Well, it's a great question, and I think part of the thing about social media, like any technology, is hopefully it's used predominantly for good, but there's always going to be cases where it gets abused, and we're all concerned about um, teen mental health, kids' mental health, and I agreed, frankly, with a lot of the aspects of the Surgeon General uh, Surgeon General report, and I think you'd find a lot of agreement within industry. We do have a teen mental health crisis. Um, no, ki no kid or teen should be on spending three plus hours a day on social media. That was in the report. The report included a lot of good tips for parents around promoting, you know, um, a moderate use of, of services, social media, tech-free zones in the home. But I also think it acknowledged that social media has played a positive role in many teens' lives. It's helped them stay connected during COVID. Uh, it helps bullied and marginalized teens who may not teens who may not come uh, from supportive families, and I think many companies agree with the report's point that they have a responsibility here too. They've many of those companies have been taking steps to design their services in age appropriate ways. The last thing I'd say too is the report called for more research, and one of the interesting things is in terms of actual congressional action is Congress actually passed a law earlier this year called the Camera Act that actually gives. Uh, money to the National Institutes of Health to do much more research. The, the report today from the Surgeon General said most of the research on this question has really been about correlation and not really delved into causation. And I think that, you know, we need really no, more research to, to dig at that question. And Adam, in your role as CEO of the Chamber of Progress, I know that you interact with a lot of different executives across these companies. I do think we're in an interesting moment for the social media industry, given the cost cutting, the reprioritization on revenue growth. Just today, Meta is going through another round of layoffs, and we know a lot of those layoffs have hit um, some of these more ancillary things like research that don't play right into the top line. In this moment in time, with these additional calls from the Surgeon General, do you think that these companies are resourcing enough against making sure that they're doing their part to protect from some of these harms that are being raised? Well, it's a concern. I think I would have liked to, seen, to have seen, for example, more acknowledgement in the report of what the companies have done. Um, so, for example, I think in the last two years, you've seen uh, Instagram you know, introduce things like daily time limits and default private accounts for young teens and more parental supervision tools on Instagram, recognizing that a young teen, a 13-year-old, is different from an older teen. Um, Google's done a lot. And yeah, I think things like layoffs could definitely have an impact, not just from the perspective of product um, design and having people to think think through these things, but research, as you said, content moderation. Content moderation is really important for teens having positive experiences. Um, you, you, you know, all the platforms want to make sure, for example, that a kid, a teenager looking for information about, say, suicide, suicidal ideation, isn't shown, um, you know, how-to videos mm -hmm. and things like that. That takes content moderation. But I also think to, to give Meta some credit here, they were doing quite a bit of research on this. And I think, unfortunately, 
one of the things that happened out of the Francis Haugen revelations is that some of, I think the company was um, criticized and maybe even penalized a little bit for, for doing that kind of research. I hate to see companies discouraged from looking themselves in the mirror because I think that that kind of self-reflection leads to these kind of improvements. I guess the criticism was because they were doing the research but not sharing it in the same way that tobacco companies did their own research but didn't share any of that with the public. I'm curious about uh, how these companies might enforce uh, some of the limitations that they put on young users through age verification. How do other industries enforce age restrictions in limiting online engagement without endangering user privacy? For instance, how does the pornography industry or the gambling industry do this? Well, frankly, I think we're seeing this play out in real time. So one of the things the report talked about, for example, is that a good number of 8 to 12-year-olds are on social media because their parents have encouraged and enabled them to lie about their age, right? Mm. And when I and, and then strangely, the report then went on to sort of say, well, we, we need tougher age limits. But I think the more honest approach is to recognize that if parents are encouraging their kids, their preteen kids to lie about their age, we might be due for a rethink of that law, right? But I do think when it comes to age verification, we have, there's a proposal in Congress right now. There are laws that have been passed this year already by Utah and Arkansas. There's others pending in other states that would require parents to uh, basically, you know, authorize their kids on social media in terms of age verification. And I think one of the real questions is how do you do that in a way that doesn't violate their privacy in the name of their security? But also, frankly, a lot of kids are coming from families where they don't have supportive parents yeah. for whom, you know, maybe social media might be a little bit, a bit of a refuge. So I think a lot of these, the, the, the concern for kids and teens is very well intentioned, but I don't know that there's enough grappling with some of the unintended consequences of some of the policy proposals that have been put forward. Yeah. And these are things that are going to take years to play out, especially if there's a lot of research uh, that needs to be done on the long-term effects of this exposure to social media. Adam, really appreciate it. Adam Kavakovich is so uh, the founder and CEO of Chamber of Progress. Coming up on Bloomberg Technology, we're going to discuss digital alternatives to regional banks in the wake of the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, AI investing, and much more with Anna Barber, a partner at M13, next. And in the meantime, we're watching shares of Shopify because BNP Paribas cut its recommendation on the Canadian e-commerce company to underperform from neutral, saying there are better opportunities elsewhere given Shopify's valuation relative to expected sales growth. Nevertheless, the stock is up by 1.7% today to find the overall declines in the equity market. This is Bloomberg. Conversations with a number of those uh, regional banks uh, because we're interested in, in buying uh, assets that they create uh, and we're looking at partnerships with some of them because they're worried uh, about how many assets they keep on their balance sheet. That was Blackstone CEO in an interview at the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha saying the investment giant is in talks with several U.S. regional banks to explore purchases of assets and loans that they originate. Schwartzman explained, quote, pressure on those regional banks won't just come from the markets. It'll come from regulators and that will make them less apt to provide credit. I want to bring in now Anna Barber. She is a partner at M13, which is a VC firm investing in the future of consumer behavior with $900 million in assets under management for her take on all of this, including what she sees going forward. Anna, it's so good to speak with you. Um, when it comes to the regional bank stresses, you have portfolio companies that banked at SVB. You also have a portfolio company that offers an alternative to services that was offered by SVB. Can you tell, tell us, share with us what you learned as a VC partner in regards to what happened in mid-March for what it means for the future of uh, e-banking? Yes, sure, Scarlett. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, mid-March was uh, a, a stressor for early stage companies, many of whom, whom banked at SVB. But I think one thing that's really important to remember is this wasn't a crisis of the tech industry. This, uh, the, 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 the changes that regional banks are experiencing are really driven by the rise in interest rates and inflation and, and are a balance sheet challenge for these regional banks like SVB and First Republic. Um, so the small companies, technology companies that bank with them, 
Many of those companies that uh, had their assets consolidated in one bank um, obviously went through a very stressful time thinking you know, for a moment over that weekend in March that their assets uh, might be in danger. So at M13, uh, our portfolio was actually in pretty decent shape because we had been recommending uh, for a while that banks diversify their funds across multiple banks. And in fact, we have one, as you mentioned, in our own portfolio. Um, called Row, which is a fully integrated banking, credit, and expense management solution targeted at small companies. And so for the companies that hadn't previously diversified, it was an opportunity for them to do so. Um, and one of the interesting things about Row is that its underlying banking partners um, are themselves a diversified collection of banks. So I think, you know, I've said the word diversification here many times, I think. Um, the message we've tried to really, uh, you know, hammer home with our portfolio is, is diversification over where you're, you're keeping your assets, um, with Row being one great option that we've recommended to our portfolio and to other startups. Anna, you said that, that the SVB uh, implosion was not a technology industry crisis, but it became one after the fact. It's become a little bit of an uncertain time in the investing world. VC dollars aren't flowing in at the same rate as when rates were lower and money was easy to go around. As you're having conversations with your portfolio companies, with your prospective portfolio companies, I'm curious if you could give us some insight uh, from them. In this uncertain time, what are they really looking for in terms of who they surround themselves with? Obviously, picking a partner like SVB ended up being a tricky situation when it comes to who they're putting their money with and also the venture partners that they're bringing into their boardrooms. What are you seeing these days? You're absolutely right. So the challenges that SVB has faced are also presenting challenges for early stage technology companies. The main thing happening is that the access to capital for startups has changed dramatically from what it was a couple of years ago. And also the operating environment has changed. So where 18 months to two years ago, startups were all getting the message that capital was read readily available, both equity and debt capital. Um, and that growth at all costs was really what we were looking for from them. Now startups are getting a very different message, which is about profitable growth, about proving that you can get to cash flow break even. And we're now in an environment where cash is harder to come by. Investors are more conservative. Although I will say what we're seeing really is just a return to the investing climate of, say, 2018, 2019. If you, if you think about what the anomaly is, it's not what the environment we're seeing today. The anomaly is really 20 to 2020 and 2021. When you can look at the rate of an, um, a venture investing and the valuation, the high valuations that we saw um, as, as really an exception to the rule and maybe even a bit of a bubble. Um, so when you think about today, what is it that founders are looking for, entrepreneurs are looking for? They are looking for, obviously, capital. And we are recommending that, that companies look to be capitalized two to three years so that they have time to grow um, without being distracted by needing to go raise additional capital. And they're also looking for investors that have experience and expertise to help them get to the next stage which is why you know, this is a great time for a firm like ours at M13. We have a lot of partners uh, with, who've been through previous downturns with a lot of operating experience who have kind of weathered previous storms. Um, mm -hmm. I was an operator in 1999. Um, I went through the dot-com bubble. I was actually an executive at PetStore.com, which if you've studied the history yes. of the internet, um, was, was a really interesting <laughs> case study. Um, and same with my other partners, lots of people with uh, you know, a little bit of gray hair and a lot of experience to help our portfolio uh, get through this, this rocky time. Anna Barber, thank you for that insight and for that historical uh, PetStores.com throwback. Uh, Anna Barber is a partner at M13. Thanks for joining us. Now, speaking of venture, the big area is AI. Insider, a Turkish AI-powered marketing platform, was just valued at almost $2 billion in a funding round that raised about $105 million. Here's CEO and co-founder Hande Sillinger at the Qatar Economic Forum explaining how they plan on using the funds for M&A. Insider still continued its growth during the last two years, although the world has faced a huge economic downturn in many ways. We have acquired one company uh, after almost like a six months ago. Now we are looking at US and Europe for acquiring more companies which are going to help Insider to grow its technology.
Insiders raised a total of $274 million to date. Now still to come, Meta is preparing for its last round of job cuts. They're going on now for what they say will improve efficiency. But employees are saying that hasn't exactly been the case. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. It's time now for Talking Tech. First up is Netflix, cracking down on account sharing in the U.S. The streaming service today outlined procedures and costs for customers who want to continue sharing their accounts with anyone outside their household. Netflix is giving them the option to share their account for an additional $8 a month. The crackdown on password sharing is a key part of Netflix's strategy to generate more revenue from existing users. Amazon's cloud customers want to try and test the chat GPT style technology that the company unveiled six weeks ago, but instead, many are being told to sit tight. People familiar with the matter say AWS product launches, uh, or those in the AWS product launch space, say they wonder if Amazon perhaps released the AI tools before they were fully ready to go to push back against the perception that it's fallen behind cloud rivals Microsoft and Google. And PC and tablet maker Lenovo shares falling the most since October 2021. This after the company posted its first quarterly profit miss in more than six years. Sales fell slightly below estimates while net income declined 72 percent in the first three months of the year. We know the global PC market shrank 29 percent during the quarter, signaling that the slump in demand is more persistent than anticipated. Alex? Well, Meta is going through its final round of job cuts today as part of CEO Mark Zuckerberg's restructuring plan that he announced in March. It impacts thousands of, of employees who've been waiting to see if they are on the cut less list across their business departments. Bloomberg Sarah Fryer is here for more details. Sarah, you and I covered this over the last two days. Um, we heard from our sources that in this kind of limbo period between Zuckerberg announcing the cuts were coming and these final emails going out at 5 a.m. Pacific time this morning to impact employees, a lot has been on pause. Can you kind of talk through what the impact has been to Meta's business, all in the name of efficiency, to actually kind of wrap up this process? When the, when the first round of layoffs happened back in November, the 13% cuts of the workforce, employees got the sense that this wasn't the end. Wall Street loved it. And when Zuckerberg started out talking about the company's performance this year, he named it the year of efficiency. And again, the shares popped and said he was going to do more cuts. So although this round of cuts was announced in March, employees have felt in this this terrible state of limbo for that whole time and from what we hear from you know you and i talking to our sources not much is getting done people don't know the priorities of the company there isn't even a product roadmap that has been established for the rest of the year um, the engineering cuts and product cuts um, those just happened about a month ago and they're still trying to clear the dust from those rounds people don't know who they can collaborate with it's it's frankly been the opposite of efficient and it's fascinating to me when I heard from a source uh, that there is no product roadmap. This is a tech company with a CEO who fancies himself a product expert. Uh, but Mark Zuckerberg has faced a lot of criticism for the direction he's taking the company in. If you are an investor, if you are a, a company watcher, an analyst, and you're seeing kind of some of the, the stall in this chaos, what is your take on where he's taking the company in this year as he kind of refocuses? Well, Basically, what has to happen is what employees tell us is they are hoping will happen is that this this is the final round of the pre-announced cuts. Now people can get back to work and they can say, OK, I know who I'm going to be working with. I know what our priorities are going to be if we have these resources. Let's try to get back on our feet. They have to do that really quickly because the stock has doubled so far on Zuckerberg's promise that they will have faster product development, that they will be more efficient. Yeah, so I, I want to follow on that, Sarah, because get back to work. Get back to work on what? Is Meta still laser focused on building out the metaverse or has it shifted gears like everyone else to AI and AI infrastructure? That, what you just said, AI is, is top of mind for all of Meta's executives. And, and on the last earnings call, Zuckerberg really focused a lot more on AI than he did on the metaverse. I think he's speaking to what people want to hear. Meta's had AI as a, as a background priority for about a decade now. 
now it's really coming to the forefront and mm. they're trying to use their position um, more, more openly. Sarah, thank you so much. Bloomberg Sarah Fryer uh, joining us from San Francisco. And that does it, of course, for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Don't forget to check out the BTech podcast. You can find it on the terminal as well as online on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. This is Bloomberg.